Uh, it's my pleasure now to be to have been asked to give you uh, a keynote that talks a little bit about an overview, necessarily brief, but uh, a quick trip through some of the interesting applications that we at M2M Now have come across in uh, recent months, looking at um, how it is that M2M and IoT is being used. Um, one of the advantages are of being a journalist, and not just because you get to the head of the queue at all sorts of events, is we do have a view in our work with things coming across our screens and our desks that may not be always uh, shared uh, more widely. And we get first view of these, and it's my privilege to be able to share a few thoughts with you today. Um, I've tried to distill for you some of these into a few examples of uh, applications of the Internet of Things. And what is it all about, you may ask? Well, it really is about everything. In fact, Cisco and GE are amongst the companies that describe it as just that, the Internet of Everything. Personally, I'm more interested in what it does than what it's called, uh, because what it does is it brings the IoT is using M2M as a whole new way of A, modeling our businesses, and B, improving our lives. Um, what I'd like to do is start with a little nightlife. Have a look at this video from the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas earlier this year, and you'll see a little of what I mean. This is from fun to fundamentals. We've been showing CSR measure lighting for over a year. So at this year's CES, we thought we'd try something a little bit more ambitious. One of our customers in the city were hosting a party in Las Vegas nightclub. And we thought, wouldn't it be great to give the DJ the power to control 1,000 glow sticks using CSR? Well, it's a bit of fun, but what is it exactly that we can learn from this? I think, first of all, you'd have to say that M2M is not just for the boring stuff in life. More importantly, perhaps, that M2M is increasingly affordable thanks to the falling cost of sensors, connectivity, and silicon. Thirdly, that M2M applications can be very scalable, very quickly scalable, and fourthly, that everything connected is really going to be the norm for the next generation. And that's important because I think the Internet of Things is about the next generation. And for one thing, as our children see how the planet's resources have been depleted or spoiled, it becomes critical to, re to protect vital industries. What, therefore, could be more fundamental than ensuring that we can all eat. I've therefore decided to choose environmental controls and farming to show you what I mean. As you may know, bees are under threat worldwide. The number of colonies in the US has fallen by 90%. I'll just say that again, 90% drop since 1962. Bees pollinate food worldwide, Using, they pollinate, pollinate crops, including apples, blueberries, cucumbers, almonds, many, many more. In fact, scientists say that 70 of the top 100 food crops have seen a fall in production due to the bee crisis. And millions of bees in the states alone are being shipped to California each year to help pollinate 
the almond crops. I mean, that really can't be a very efficient way of going about our agricultural, meeting our agricultural needs. The threat is believed to come from a mix of pesticides, lack of wild forage, disease, and parasites. And one primary cause is the Varroa destructor mite. But eliminating these mites has always meant using harmful pesticides, which brings you back to square one. Now the University of Minnesota is researching a non-chemical way to control these mites with an easy-to-use, pesticide-free, compostable M2M solution. An agricultural communications company called Eltopia is working with M2M specialist Gemalto to sterilize these, mi these mites, and thereby preventing them from breeding and taking over the hives. The solution, which is called Mite Knot, uses a smart beehive frame that automatically manages the temperature of the beehives. By applying heat at a specific temperature and a specific time, the solution can interrupt the mites fertilization and prevent them reproducing. Now sensors embedded in the frame monitor the hive temperature to identify the stages of the mites reproductive cycle and a controller sends data to Gemalto's M2M module which acts as a cellular gateway sending data over the internet to Eltopia's BeSafe application. BeSafe then issues commands back to the module and the controller raises the heat in the hive sterilizing the mite larvae. Now, as you can see, I'm not sure how legible it is, but I'll get, run it past you in a second. Professor Marla Spivak at the University of Minnesota is very complimentary about the IoT solution now under test. She says, Altopia's Might Not project is the most innovative and holds the most promise to turn the bee crisis around more than any other idea that has come along in a very long time, maybe ever. Given the criticality of this industry, that's pretty good news. If it continues to go well, it is hoped to launch the product, the, the product this autumn, so in the next few weeks and months. But M2M is being used in weather forecasting as well to avert a water crisis in Brazil. As you may know, Brazil is the world's fifth largest country, not only in size, but uh, also in its rainforest. It is over 60% covered in rainforest. Accurate weather forecasting therefore requires a nationwide data collection unit that includes remote locations with very restricted access. Yet, at the same time, cities like Sao Paulo have an ongoing water shortage of their own, making accurate weather forecasts vital for people and for government and businesses. Now, Telit and Brazil's DuoDigit have recently deployed a new modem in a weather station's network, and you can see it here. This is collecting real-time data on humidity, barometric pressure, rainfall, rain rate, and wind speeds. The DD3G modems transmit data from all weather stations, both in cities and in remote rainforests in tough environmental conditions. And the modems employ telet modules operating over 3G networks. But they can switch automatically from HSPA Plus to Edge and GSM if 3G coverage is not available. And the product works across all of Brazil's mobile operator networks. With these connected weather stations, the information can be uh, obtained faster, more accurately, and in real time, improving the reliability of the data for analysis. In parts of Europe, there's a water crisis of a different kind. In Britain last year, we suffered terrible flooding. 
and I know it was the same in many, many parts of Europe. Towns and villages like mine were cut off for days or even weeks. Crops were ruined, and agricultural land was made unusable, quite apart from the obvious threat to human life. And this often happened because we were unprepared for the effects of flooding. And flood prevention measures were not taken in time, even where they existed. The historic city of Oxford was particularly badly affected. So to prevent this happening again, a group called Oxford Floodnet was formed to test a local IoT-based early warning system. It has the backing of a specialist IoT firm called Love Hertz and is supported by Nominet, who are perhaps better known as the .uk domain registry. And they are funding research to map the area's river speeds, its flows, and the levels. Let's have a look at their work. The Oxford Flood Network is a citizen sensor network. Community groups installing sensors in locations around the city, gathering data in real time about water levels and potential for flooding, uh, and then sharing that data amongst themselves and wider the community. The sensors collect the data and send them using a variety of wireless technologies back to a database where it's presented as a flood map and also as an API. This provides real-time information that can help with things like road closures and understanding whether your business can open. The data is more accurate because it's hyper-local data. It's from individuals who understand where there are actually problems to monitor. Nominet R&D is looking for partners to help test some of our ideas around the Internet of Things. So we thought this was a great opportunity to give back to the local area and do something for us. So we're helping in a number of ways. We're helping to fund some of the development of the sensors. We're also providing part of the back-end communications infrastructure. The idea is that the data created through the Oxford Fund Network is made publicly available uh, and that part of the assistance in Omnet is provided will be building a website dedicated to that data and allow people to access it. The code is open source and the data is provided with an open license. Very exciting to be part of Catapult, and I think one of the very important things with the Internet of Things is that you cannot create it all yourself. You need to find other people to collaborate with, and you are part of a staff or a data value chain, and you need a location like the Catapult to meet people. It's a fantastic project, it's really exciting. I think it's good to have a project that's actually testing out some of the ideas around the Internet of Things. It's good to find a company that is actually doing something, improving people's lives um, through it and also implementing innovative technology. In the future, we're all going to be living in some kind of digital, smart city kind of environment. Uh, we need literacy in how these work so that we can demystify them and actually participate in them. What I particularly like about that was one of the closing comments that you cannot do it all yourself, which is why events like today's are so critical. Interestingly, the trial is using Nominet's new TV white space network to provide wireless connectivity for sensors installed by Love Hertz. In the initial project, just 30 sensors are monitoring water levels, but very soon they hope to incorporate more sensors positioned by the local community itself. As you probably know, the TV White Space Network uses the uh, wireless spectrum that's been freed up by the switch to digital TV broadcasting. However, the available set of frequencies varies, so the database that Nominet has developed has to perform complex calculations to ensure that the devices can to ensure that devices are told which frequencies they can use and which air, in which area and for how long. 
Sadly, there's only been time for a bit of a whirlwind tour of a few new applications of the Internet of Things. But I hope that that has been enough to whet your appetite, fire up your interest. Of course, you'll always find more stories like this in M2M Now. And uh, it's my pleasure to thank the organizers for the opportunity to take part in uh, sharing this information with you.